Oh, hi everybody. Rob, what are you doing? You're not, you're, you're not in your normal home. I'm somewhere else. Like I'm meeting somebody here later. But now I'm going to talk to a very special guest over the internet, uh, as usual. This man is truly a, a global comedian. He is a pure comedian. Please welcome Russell Howard. Just look at him. Even in silence, he's magnificent. Can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, it's still silent, but still magnificent. Okay, okay. Oh, because, because, because I haven't got my earpiece in. This is it. <laughs> Which of these two men is older and less in touch with technology? How are you? I'm really well. Thanks for having us on, pal. Where are you? Where do I find you? Well, you don't find me at my usual venue, which is home. You find yeah. me a stone's throw from the home of King Henry VIII. And I won't have to tell an educated man like you where that is. Right. You probably will. Is that Hampton Court? Well done. Hampton Court. I'm just across the road from Hampton Court at a lovely hotel because I'm doing an in-person one of these later on. I'm not, I haven't moved out. I haven't had a row with my wife. I'm not living at the hotel. And I'm around my brother's house, by the way, hence the... Uh... That's Bristol from dawn till dusk. Uh, we, we have started, by the way, in case you're about to be incredibly indiscreet. No, but it was the, the oddest, one of the oddest interviews I ever did was Frank Skinner had a show on the BBC iPlayer where he would interview people. They would turn your house into the studio. And I'd just done the final episode of Good News and we'd had a rap party and I was a bit hungover. They got there at nine o'clock. Um, and I said, okay, you set up and I'm going to uh, go and have some breakfast to try and kind of get rid of this hangover. Um, and I arrived back at 11 and Frank Skinner was in my kitchen having his hair cut. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he sort of looked up and went, all right, mate, how are you going? And I said, uh, fine. And it was, but it was a real window into the level of celebrity that he'd got to that, that he didn't go, is this fine? Like, if I'd been in his house and I, I was drinking, like, a Diet Coke, I would say, oh, I, they said it was okay to have from the... But his hair was all over my kitchen. And he was like... I said, you, you're having your hair cut in my kitchen? He was like, that's all right, isn't it? I went, yeah, it's fine, but I'm going to have to explain this to my wife. There's, like, Frank Skinner's hair is kind of... all, oh, and there was a lot of it. It was a really strange start to the interview. He was a sort of hero of yours, wasn't he? Because I, I've been reading, he's someone who is cited as one of your influences. So tell me you didn't take some of the discarded hair and keep it. Do you know, I should have done. Like, the 15-year-old the me would have... I'd have turned that into a wig and worn it. <laughs> it's a bit like you and Elvis. It's that thing, if you, if you came home and Elvis is still with us and he's getting a trim, you have that dilemma of... Okay, this is going to be weird for my missus because you know the king's hair is ever it's on the George Foreman grill, it's in the cups. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was it was really coming off him, and yeah. it was very fine hair. So my love for Frank Skinner was tempered by the fury that I would feel that I would get from my wife because she would be like, "Why have you cut your hair in the kitchen?" And then I would have to say it was Frank Skinner, and that sounds like a lie. Oh, Frank Skinner came here and had his hair cut in the kitchen. You know what I mean? So I was playing forward this, this scenario where his little thin, mousy hair was like... like and it, it just kept appearing. It was in bits of butter, like weeks later. <laughs> we couldn't get rid of Skinner. Yeah, we didn't need to collect it. It was just... It accumulated. There's probably still bits of Skinner's DNA in my kitchen. In my intro, I've said you're sort of you're this global presence. I knew you were, but until I properly looked at it, you really play in a lot of countries. Yeah, yeah, it's the best. But the, you sort of started doing it about five years ago and um, kind of doing gigs in Europe and then gigs in America and Australia I've been doing a, a wee bit earlier. But it... it it reignites your love of stand-up because you get to travel and you you then you get that kind of lovely like street level knowledge of a place and it's I don't know it just broadens your outlook on life and your kind of comedy tell me about meeting Billy Connolly so I did it was through zoom but it still counts for me but I, I interviewed yeah. him for my TV show and oh. just 
it's so difficult. I mean, when when you meet someone that means so much to you, to remain kind of calm because he. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking my friend Danny Boy, the comedian Danny Boy, was like, you just interviewed Jesus. And that's what it felt yes, like. It felt yes, like yeah. you just can't explain to him what he means to you. I, I was doing a run of, of stand-up shows some years ago now in, in the West End. And I did, it was a Saturday night, and I didn't think it was very good. And I came off in a slightly bad mood. And my tour manager said, oh, Billy Connolly was in tonight. And, and he had, he had bought a ticket wow. and, and walked in and sat in the circle. And I thought, oh, well, this is, this is horrendous because that was not a good show. He can't have liked that. It was when he was filming Gulliver's Travels with James Corden. Mm. So James phoned me on the Monday and goes, <clears throat> he goes, oh, yeah, Billy came to see your show. He really liked it. Right? And I, was, and I, and I went, ah. Oh. Did he? I don't think so, James. I, I don't think he's very good. And in the background, I heard, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I oh. thought it was wonderful. Oh. And then, and I'm still, I was still, I st oh, he's being nice. He's being nice. Because I like my stuff, but, eh, you know. But then, a couple of months later, I ran into him at a, at a, at a do, and he quoted things back. He said, you know when you, know when you said about so-and-so? Mm. That made me think of so and so, and you're just like. The experience I had was like when I made him laugh during the Zoom chat. Like th that feeling for me, that is something I will never lose. Just like I just said something off the cuff, and Billy Connolly laughed. I love him. I couldn't love him more. And the fact that I've made him laugh, and you, he's thought Billy Connolly has made a cup of tea. <laughs> and thought about a thing you said. That is, I mean. So, congratulations on lubricant, which we, which we want to talk about. And I'm yeah. interested to know where our meeting in Australia fell, because you've got the documentary that goes with it until the wheels mm -hmm. came off, right? So, mm -hmm. to explain to people, you were gearing up for a big tour, the pandemic came. Yes. Where where does that because when I saw you in Australia you weren't performing there I remember you you were just doing some press and having a holiday is that right yeah yeah that's exactly it so me and my wife had we we were spending a month in Tamarama oh what um, a life. which is on the um the, just off of Bondi Beach and like the last week I went and did some press for the tour that I was going to do in 2020 because um, I thought as I'm there, and obviously I didn't get to do that. But I then went back. I was I, I'm, I managed to do my British tour in 2019 at the tail end. And then 2020, obviously, you know, that was lockdown. And then I managed to get back to Australia and New Zealand in January 2021 because I had gigs in place and we had to apply to the, the New Zealand government to see if we could still do these shows. The government rubber stamped us. So me and my tour manager, Kumar, went to New Zealand. We we're in the hotel for two weeks, the quarantine hotel. But after two weeks, I was able to do the tour in COVID free New Zealand. And it was extraordinary. It was like being in the future and the past. And I felt so <laughs> kind of like, but I felt so lucky that you couldn't you couldn't believe that 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 we were doing a tour. We did a tour, and we did twenty gigs, thirty gigs in New Zealand. It was it was unbelievable. I, I read that. So your wife works uh, with the NHS. So she's a she's a doctor. She, yeah, yeah. She's, a doctor. Yeah. she's a frontline worker. Mm. I read that back in Britain, I don't know if this was before or after, to, to protect her, you went and moved back in with your mm -hmm. parents, is that right? Yes. So uh, And into your, into your childhood bedroom? Yeah, my childhood. So, so how, how, how was that? I had my 40th birthday in my childhood bedroom. <laughs> yeah. It was, and how uh, did that affect you? When, when, when I read this, I, I, I was reminded of uh, when I, my first marriage ended. I had a period of about a year of kind of being adrift, right? Mm. And 
um, Easter was coming up and my, my wife and the kids were going down to her parents to see them and have a lovely time. And I had nothing to do. I just, mm. you know, well, I, I didn't want to be on my own. I was in a flat at the time. I mean, it was, it was a bad time. And so I went down and I stayed with my parents, right? And <laughs> I'd never lived in the house that they live in now. I'd, I'd moved out by yeah. then. But so I'm in a little bedroom and then that, that's fine. That's all good. But one day we decide we're going to go for a drive down to West Wales because we used to go there a lot when I was a kid. We thought that'd be yeah. nice for him. That'll cheer him up. But the mistake we made was I sat in the back of the car. And at one point, it was on the journey back, I think, I made my dad stop the car. He was driving. My mom was I said, I can't do this. I can't. I have to sit in the front because sitting in the back, already you feel like a failure, right? Your, your yeah. marriage has, has ended. And you're sitting in the back of your parents' car like this, look, yeah. looking out the window. And I thought I was going to just crack up. So we pulled yeah. over to a lay-by. <laughs> I sit in the front and my mum is in the back. Yeah. <laughs> it was so like going shopping with your mum and <laughs> sort of going for a You know, remember when you were only allowed to do your, your one walk of the day? I would do that yeah. walk with my mum. Oh, would it, you? It, it, it was so, it was very, and then, but that moment when you go to bed and, you know, I, I don't want to get too graphic here, but, you know, you, you'd sort of have a, a sort of a fumble with yourself and, and you'd, you'd feel kind of wretched about that as it were, but you'd then look up. I remember, <laughs> I remember seeing a poster of the Liverpool forward Robbie Fowler, which was still on my wall and it looked like Fowler was really disappointed. Like, do you know what I mean? He was like, it, there was this sort of sense of like, what are you doing? You're still doing that? Come on. Like, it was- I've got to say, let me just say, nobody, nobody has, nobody has smuggled the subject to which you have referred into yeah. mainstream culture with such ease since the Seinfeld episode, The Contest. You are the rightful heir, the way you casually, and you've used such, such a family-friendly word as fumble. But, but we all know, we all yeah. know the despicable act <laughs> to which you were referring and the thought that you would do it in the home of your parents in front of yeah. Robbie Fowler, who's done nothing to deserve this. Yeah. frankly, <laughs> is appalling. Yeah, well, it's that thing of, like, it looked like Fowler knew that he'd been dragged into this. It, it <laughs> felt like that he, it somehow his eyes, that he was in this goal, like, he, he sort of turned to me and go, hey, I've just scored a goal against Arsenal, and this is a moment in time, and now you've dragged me into a sordid story about your onanistic proclivities. It's a great story. <laughs> going from I, I thought we were going to explore how you reconnect with your mum on the walk. It <laughs> no, yeah, well, exactly. And, but but it, to get specific about it, because they've got a headboard, I was having to hold the headboard so there was no kind of creaking. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it was this. Yeah, it was. It was, a t it was a tough time. It was a tough... But it's a roundabout way of saying I wasn't having any illegal parties like the Tories. I was having a... <laughs> I was having a masturbatory breakdown in front of one of my heroes. Oh, that's very funny. All right, listen. Yeah. Um, we, we've only got you for a little bit longer. I wanted to talk about... You, you, you're, you're, you're older than I, I thought. I, I learned this a while ago. But you have a youthful demeanour, which mm. is exacerbated is not the word by your youthful attire you were obsessed with this aren't they like whenever whenever you see me the the, the topic of t-shirts always comes up and i always feel like you're a a tailor waiting to pounce and <laughs> that you're you you want to see me dressed up don't you yeah no, i wonder when that, look there's there's a part in every man's evolution um, yeah. And I just, and, and you, you rock, as they say, that look very well. You're wearing a hoodie now. Um, yeah, you've yeah. probably got one of your long sleeved, two coloured t shirts on underneath it. it. It's a young look. Do you ever yeah. see yourself, because you're 41 now, am I right? I am, yeah. When are you planning? Have you given any thought to moving towards a more Jimmy Carr like appearance? The only time I wear suits um, would be weddings and funerals. 
can I just say this? But yes. were you were you to wear a t-shirt on stage? Were you not to wear a suit? It would it would scream breakdown. <laughs> I knew you were good. Russell, thanks for taking the time. Really Pleasure, appreciate it, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Joyous, yeah. What fun. See you later, mate. Hey, I'm going to do this. I never do that, but I felt compelled to do that. Nice, lovely. I, I've started doing this as well. That's oh, have I you? Like. Oh, I've started doing God. that as well. That's a new yeah. one. I, do, I sometimes I've done this to an audience. I've done that as if to say, "Thanks a lot. It means a lot to me." And which it does, but but you know, it's a very inappropriate way of proclaiming it. Anyway, listen, you're, you're a busy guy. You've got skateboarding to do. Speak to you soon. <laughs> Very good.